Along the crossroads of East and West, and amongst the mightiest of cultures, the island of Cyprus has continued since the dawn of civilization to prosper and create. Cypriots cultivated the land, carved and chiseled rocks, stones, marble, extracted, smelted, and gave forms of art precious copper to gold and silver. They accepted and absorbed valuable exchanges and transactions brought to them by sea from countries near and far. The island continued to create relentlessly and create bridges and links between great civilizations. Cyprus culture has existed for millennia and has left indelible footprints deeply engraved on the world's cultural map. The island civilization was studied and assessed by the world's best scientists and has rightfully earned its position as the core of Mediterranean culture, the cradle of world civilization. 
Culture is a fundamental human right. A safeguard of human existence and the necessary connection with the past so as to ensure the correct route to the future. It is an expression of society and an essential tool of education. Culture is one of the most precious human rights. It expresses and praises mankind and its deeds and is found deeply rooted everywhere within the soil, on stone or rock, on clay, canvas or paper. Culture is and always will be one of the most important dimensions of human life. Whenever there is a war, it's actually women's bodies that are attacked and the, the body of a woman is the battlefield. So that's the first target. The second one is the cultural heritage. The libraries, the churches, the holy places. And the third part is the name. To change the names is to change the identity, basically. So this is taking place everywhere in the world where there is a, a conflict or a war. Cyprus is not an exception. But today to see this devastation and the dismantling of the old churches and the old European history is to me shocking. It's so upsetting and it's, it's, my heart is full of sorrow. I, could, I had to leave a few moments ago. I couldn't see this. It breaks my heart to see that places that people have considered holy are dismantled and vandalized in such an awful way. I mean, it doesn't matter what we do today if the solution of the conflict isn't solved first. We have, though, um, international law on our side. There is a very important uh, international treaty called the Hague Convention, which is a, uh, was issued in 1954, you know, and it today has about uh, 150, 120 member states. I was in the UNESCO board for many years, and of course we could we could address the problems, we could restore some of the buildings, but if people are still using them over again as as barns for their animals, as storage places if people are vandalizing them, we need protection, first of all. In the case of the uh, northern part of uh, uh, Cyprus, as you know, we have very difficulty in, in intervening directly because the UN cannot. So we can only appeal to uh, Turkey and, and whatever entities <laughs> is there you know, to respect because these are things that uh, you know, they, they belong to uh, international uh, civil, civil, civil <laughs> society. I mean, they have to uh, respect it. For over 37 years now, since the Turkish army invaded the territories of the Republic of Cyprus in 1974, Cypriots are deprived of their fundamental right to their culture and civilization. Since then, Cypriot culture has suffered a huge blow. and destruction of Christian monuments, illegal exportation of works of art, illegal excavations within sites belonging to the Department of Antiquities of the Republic. Added to all these insults against world civilization is the illegal demographic alteration more than 1,600,000 settlers have been brought over from Turkey since 1974, altering in this manner the demographic character of the island. Since 1974, numerous mosques have been built in the occupied part of Cyprus, altering in this way not only the character, but also the history of this island. 
Greek Cypriots need to show passports in their own country when they want to visit their villages, homes and neighbourhoods. Pay entrance fees to visit sites, monuments and churches that belong to them. The original Greek names of the villages of Cyprus are printed on maps dating to the Middle Ages. They are to be found in Portland charts and the Solaria. And yet, Turkish names were given to villages, to roads, to place names, to monuments. Cypriot traditions, cultural richness, all perish under the boots of the Turkish soldiers. World-famous archaeological sites like Engomi, Salamis, Soli and Vuni, temples, theatres, palaces and entire cities, a living proof of our ancestors' presence and creation are today under Turkish military occupation, with irreversible consequences both for their existence and their physical survival. Museums were looted, private collections sold abroad. International conventions govern archaeological excavations carried out in areas under military occupation. However, these conventions are repeatedly violated and illegal excavations continue to take place in areas that within the exclusive competence and jurisdiction of the legal state, such as Salamis, Engomi and Soli. Findings illegally exported, disrupting in this manner the continuity of our civilization. And all this is done without any conviction or any serious consequences for Turkey. Precious samples of Cypriot culture were found in Western markets and the US. Treasures of Cypriot antiquity, priceless Byzantine icons and mosaics, manuscripts, paintings, books, all sold, while the entire civilized world watched with indifference the huge theft and fraud that was and still is being carried out against a culture and a civilization. The 575 Christian monasteries, churches and chapels are held hostage by the Turkish army that continues to occupy the northern part of Cyprus. Churches belonging to the Orthodox, the Catholic, the Anglicans, the Maronites, the Armenians, places of Christian prayer and worship, most in terrible condition. Some turn to warehouses, or junkyards, or restaurants, all unprotected, uncared, empty of the valuable and cherished contents all left wide open to the northerly winds and rain. regime allows the Greek Cypriot displaced people to perform the divine liturgy to a very limited number of churches in their native towns and only once or twice a year. Even in these rare occasions the occupation regime imposes arbitrary restrictions.
people are not allowed to pray in their churches, people cannot exercise this basic human right. Since 1974, 19 churches and chapels dating from the 15th to the 19th centuries have been completely destroyed, eradicated from the cultural map. 100 churches are in a terrible state and are in imminent danger of collapsing. 85 churches were turned into mosques. And yet, the government of Cyprus has restored a very important holy place for the Muslims, Hala Sultan Tege. Whereas it takes particular care and restores Ottoman monuments and places of worship. A Gothic church in Nicosia, St. Mary of the Augustians, that was transformed to a mosque in 1570 and belongs to the Antiquities Department of the Republic of Cyprus, was offered to the Muslim population in Nicosia for their religious needs. For over 37 years, the legitimate government of the Republic of Cyprus calls for help and sympathy from the civilized world to save all these monuments. These monuments do not belong only to the Cypriots. They belong to the global community. See, for us, heritage is not political. Because for us, of course, you know, heritage is an expression of culture, an expression of human society, human history, and so on. So we, we, for us, it's normal to see heritage as a common. In the 21st century, the rich, ancient civilization of Cyprus, a member state of the European Union, is threatened by the continuing illegal military occupation of over a third of its territory by Turkey. Rescuing these monuments should be the duty of all.
to Discovering Orthodox Christianity. I'm Stacey Spanos, your host for this series of programs designed to explain the basic teachings of Orthodox Christianity. We're honored to be filming at the Holy Cross Chapel on the campus of Hellenic College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Boston. In today's program, we'll discuss Orthodoxy, Faith in Action, and the ministries of the Greek Orthodox Church in America. Our guests today are His Eminence, Metropolitan Nicholas of Detroit. Thank you Thank for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Also, Reverend Father John Vlachos, pastor of the Greek Orthodox Church of the Holy Resurrection in Brookville, New York. Thank you for being Thank here you, as Stacey. well. So, Your Eminence, let me begin with you. In your <laughs> knowledge of the history of the church, has the church always been involved with philanthropic efforts? Stacy, I think the church from the beginning is an issue of God calling us uh, in our hearts and in our souls to see something beyond ourselves. So for the Orthodox Church, yes, from the very beginning, uh, the gospel message is about helping someone else. It's interesting that Jesus was able to distill, if we would say, the whole gospel message, the whole message of the Old Testament into two things, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. It never was centered about me in the beginning. It's not about the person individually. It's about the person and his ability to be that face and tool and hand of God to others. So from the beginning, yes, the church has been involved. Jesus laid it out, and then others certainly picked up that mantle, Father John. Explain to me some of the people along the way who have really defined what it means to be charitable to our fellow man. Right. Well, the Lord showed that example for us, um, being the good shepherd, saying, I've come to save the lost sheep. And so from there, the apostles continued that message and that example of serving, of helping, of healing, of taking care of <clears throat> people and their needs. So we have in the book of the uh, Acts of the Apostles, we see the apostles' ministry in aiding, assisting, helping all of those people that are less fortunate. And because of the need swelled to such a degree, they then ordained the first deacons for the purpose of serving the tables, helping those um, that were in need. And from those apostles on throughout the centuries of Christianity, we see our saints, our holy mothers, our holy fathers. We see them taking care of the poor, helping, sharing, um, following Christ's example of love that forces you in the most beautiful way to go to the limit of breaking your body and spilling your blood for the other. And that is the example that Christ has given us, and we as his followers are called to do that. Your Eminence, some of the most notable, of course, St. Basil. There are so many academies and other organizations set up in St. Basil's name. The, the church, you know, I think once, once Christianity became that uh, legal religion, and as you know, we have just celebrated the anniversary of uh, the Edict of Milan, and our patriarch uh, as well, our, our, our patriarch made note of that. But what happened then was a turnover because the church could now, the people as family, as groups, as, 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 as units, could now begin to develop and uh, officially help setting up not just schools but orphanages. The church was the body that really began this issue of uh, of uh, public institutional assistance. And I think we see that from the fourth century, we see that all the way through the Byzantine period, and we see that even today. It starts from the individual, it's that individual conversion to God's message that tells us we have to be concerned about the other. And from that, everything else, I think, follows through. In this day and age, especially here in the West, we live in relative comfort. But you can think back to what life must have been like in the fourth century, in the first century prior to that, how much suffering there was and how much the church probably helped so much with probably not a lot of krima, as they say, not a lot of money to do so, Father John. Yeah, <clears throat> they used the means that they had available to them. And um, in each generation, in each century, we are called to serve the basic needs of the people. And it doesn't have to be anything beyond uh, the ordinary. Our Lord gave the most classic and beautiful example of the second coming where he says where the world is gonna be judged and separated into two groups. And the criterion is, did you give someone water? Did you give someone food? Did you visit them? Did you give them some clothing? Did you 
perform and offer basic human needs to those of your brothers and sisters around you. So that's what we're called to do. Give in these basic needs, which then promotes love, compassion, and hope. For a long time, your eminence in the U.S., the Orthodox Christian Church was not really known for its charitable acts. At what point do you believe that began to change? I'm going to uh, suggest that the individual parishes had a sense of philanthropy. But in the late 20s in particular, even earlier with the foundation and formation of the first Philoptochus units in uh, Philoptos chapters in some of the uh, parishes, and with its formalization with a charter from New York State, we really began this process of institutional assistance. It came really through our women, and the women became the great benefactors because they were the, the people who knew how to nourish. They were the people who could, who could offer that tender touch. And if you look now in the United States, our philoptochos of the Archdiocese is an army of 27,000 women, 27,000 women whose goal is to help the other. And they help in scholarship. They help in institutions. They, we help with St. Basil's, an academy for children who might be less fortunate than others. It helps through food drives. It helps through medical. We have a medical luncheon coming up every year from our philoptochos. The philoptochos has <laughs> never failed and never faltered to offer that money on behalf of the community on behalf of the church. So I think right now, if we, if we consider that and we recognize that those 27,000 women in the United States, members of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese and the Philoptochos, they are the second largest women's organization in this country. It's not a small achievement. It talks uh, a lot about our church. It talks about them as individuals who have heard God's message, go and tell what I have done go and help, go and visit, as Father said. And in many cases, if I would amplify even what Father said, it was not really, uh, uh, it, it was very often give your second cloak. Jesus was mm -hmm. dealing with that. You have to give one. And there were times even from the beginning, to be fair, uh, St. Paul asks us to make a collection of money to send really to the people in Jerusalem. It was really things, give the first offerings that you have. So that that is institutional in the church from the beginning, freer after the liberation of the church. And now in the United States, in particular for archdiocese, not, not that every parish doesn't have other things that, that occur, but the Philoptos really for us uh, is, is, uh, takes a crowning lead. I sure do. Takes a crowning and, lead. and Father John, just hearkening back to when the church developed here in the United States, it was brought over by immigrants. And if you think about the immigrants' life back in the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, it was tough. Sometimes it's tough enough to take care of yourself and your family, let alone thinking right. of others. Right. They were in survival mode at that point, trying, um, trying to integrate into the American culture and to become productive members of society. And because of their faith, because of their hard work, uh, they did achieve that. And I think that's where Philoptochos grew out of. I think their first basic movements were to help those immigrants get on their yes. feet. And once people started getting on their feet, now they can move forward and, and begin to see, now what is my place here? God has planted me here. It's time for me to grow. And how do I grow? With the message of Christ, being obedient to his gospel and becoming his followers and doing those things that he's called us to do here on this country in this, in this land. Now we've talked about philoptochos a lot. Your Eminence, explain what that means to those who don't know. Philoptochos is coming from the, the Greek word meaning friend of the poor. And as an, an organization of the Archdiocese, it really extends that, that <clears throat> friendship to meet the needs of those who are less fortunate or in catastrophic circumstances, whatever it may be. The, the church, the Lord, is the friend of the poor. Let's talk about um, ways to give. Father John, you put it so well that sometimes it's a glass of water, uh, a kind word to somebody, or a meal. It doesn't have to be necessarily these grand things, but as we were discussing before we started taping, it begins with the individual. That is the first level of charity that we should try to espouse and, and to give. Absolutely. Tell me what we can do to become <laughs> more charitable Orthodox Christians. Yeah, from a, from a personal level and then building up to the parish, and then his eminence can speak to the metropolis and archdiocese and throughout the world. 
but it just um, it begins with each individual person saying, I have a vocation, I have a, a, a job, I have a, a role to play, and that is within the circle that I am dealing with, within my family, within my job, within my schooling, whatever it is to be a person of love, of compassion, helping wherever we see that, and then taking those talents into the parish, and then just really fortifying all of our talents, all of our time and our treasure, and really making a difference uh, within our small little area. Because one thing we have to think about as a parish is if our parish just disappeared, would anybody notice in the community? So we have to make an imprint. We have to make an impression on our little society and our little community. And if every parish does that, then we, we fortify each other and we establish strong metropolises and, and a strong archdiocese. Absolutely. So, and going back to the individual, the phrase came up in my head, charity begins at home. And we must remember how important it is to be charitable to our spouses, to our children, to our parents. I think that message gets lost on a lot of people because we're so comfortable with those people that we may not present our best selves to them. Uh, I think you have a good point there, and I, I think that that comes from that sense, especially today, that the world revolves around us. And the scripture message really is we are all called to something more, and in order to accomplish that, we have to look at the other, the husband to the wife, the wife to the husband, to the children, and the children up to the parents and back. It is, it is uh, I think, though, at its heart, a personal issue. It is a personal hearing of God, just as he called Paul on the road to Damascus. What are you doing? What are you? We must hear that in our hearts too, in order to have that sense of conversion, that it is not simply group think, I give because somebody else gave. That works, it helps, it's an encouragement. Mm -hmm. But there is a difference in giving when one is committed in one's heart, because it, it becomes a freedom. When a person is committed to the gospel, a person is really freed because ownership sometimes is irrelevant. I don't need all of these things. I can give so someone else will have more. We begin to watch that. So I think it starts with that individual. I think it's embodied in the parish. And I think as Father said, there's an important issue. Every parish must make a local difference. Every parish must make a local difference. There are times when we are going to uh, join national uh, issues, metropolis-wide issues, but every parish, I think, has to make a difference because the important, that important statement, will anyone notice if the right. parish stops tomorrow? That's extraordinarily important. It has to make a difference in the, in the area that it's in. And from the parish to the metropolis. How many churches are in your metropolis in Detroit? We have approximately 45. I say that because they're not, with demographic changes, with Rust Belt changes, they're not all able to be served by priests regularly, and some really have no functional uh, service. So even though you are in charge of these 45, give or take, parishes, you, as, as the bishop, as a metropolitan there, you like to see the local charity. You, yes. you could say, well, you know, let's consecrate it he or concentrate it here, and I will dole it out. But you like to help we do, we do some sure. on the metropolis level, but I want each parish, exactly as Father said, I want each parish to make that difference so that someone sees that and says, hmm, that community, we're not certain always what it means, especially in the United States, Greek Orthodox Church, what does that mean? But they will know, we, you will know them by their fruits, and the fruits are the gifts of love. So we want that. I think all of the bishops want that. We are a small minority when it comes to religions here in America. Do you believe, Father John, that the Greek Orthodox name is getting out there through our charitable work? Because certainly we don't advertise on TV. We don't have mega churches that are broadcast every Sunday. Right. To, to a certain degree, I think the Philoptikos has allowed us to be out there much more. And uh, as His Eminence said, we are the second largest women's philanthropic group, um, at least in America, maybe national, uh, internationally. So uh, Philoptikos has taken us in a great way in this regard. And um, sometimes it goes against a little bit the orthodox ethos of promoting right. what you're doing. You know, there, there's once a tobacco company that spent $250,000 feeding the hungry. 
And that year they spent $20 million advertising that. They did that. So we don't want to, um, you know, we don't, we don't blow our own horn, you know. We, we do what we do uh, simply, lovingly, faithfully. And hopefully the word will get out there by God's grace, but we, we want to continue to be faithful to where we are and, uh, and you know, allow the, the communities around us to, to, to see what we're doing. Your Eminence, would you agree with that? Would you like to weigh in? Uh, I agree, and I, I think, though, that what we also find is this beginning from the individual, moving to the parish, to the metropolis, to the archdiocese, there is this, this groundswell of people who are committed to a cause of helping others. And so from the leadership of our patriarch, when he called for assistance with Haiti, to our archbishop, when he has called for assistance with any of the uh, Hurricane Katrinas, anything that has happened, our church as a whole has been able to move through that. I agree wholeheartedly, though, on this important issue. It's, sometimes it's, it's um, odd to want to beat your own horn, and I get it's, it's a concern. The, the, you know, the idea was to give because we want to give, not simply because somebody will recognize us. That could be done in a way by anybody. There are many philanthropists in this country. Uh, they give because they want to give. They may have extra money. They don't give because God has called them to a cause and a mission. They give for whatever their own reasons are, and there's a, there's a difference in that tenor, I Is think. that the stance the church takes? Give, but don't toot your own horn? We're not supposed to put on a proud face and tell others when we're fasting during Lent. That is one of the issues, I think. However, at, at times, it's important to acknowledge it because it encourages other people, because otherwise people think, isn't the church helping? Well, the church is helping. So right. we have to talk about it, right. but we have to talk about it with a kind of Christian humility. Right. We're doing this not because we're so wonderful, but because God is wonderful. We are able to do this because God has called us into this action. And, and in so doing, uh, we become greater than we are. The late Father Ifstathios from the metropolis of Detroit used to tell me, uh, Father Nicholas, I was a priest, when you honor others and give, you honor yourself. And I think that's uh, 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 the way our, our church wants to really look better. Mm -hmm. Father John, let me ask you about some of the other ministries that, the, that our faith has, the IOCC and the OCMC. What are those and when were they established? Those are two wonderful initiatives that were started, both of them during um, Archbishop Iacovos's years. And um, it was an inter-Orthodox collaborative and IOCC stands for Interna International Orthodox Christian Charities, and OCMC stands for Orthodox Christian Mission Center. So the IOCC is our, I guess, our main way of supporting and giving internationally to specific needs, um, disasters, um, trying to um, alleviate poverty and suffering in various countries, both Orthodox and non-Orthodox throughout the world. And the OCMC, they're focused more on going to areas that they're invited and proclaiming and sharing the Orthodox faith, teaching the people the gospel of our Lord, showing them the good news, which is the Lord's message of forgiveness, of healing, the message that God loves you, God is with you, God is not against you, and um, this really um, has changed many, many countries. Um, specifically, in my mind, I'm thinking of Africa, where OCMC is an incredible work throughout those areas. Give us an example of some of the things they've done. <clears throat> I know that specifically in Kenya, they've established uh, seminaries, they've established hospitals, they've established schools. They focused on some of those key elements that a society needs to thrive, and that is education, that is worship, and that is acts of philanthropy, and that is um, elements of health, you know, um, nursing areas, hospitals, um, rehab centers, things of this nature. Your Eminence, I'm sure you've encountered uh, many of the missionaries that have been involved in this organization. What are the stories that they tell you about the impact Orthodox Christians are having around the world? Uh, first, they speak with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving that a difference was able to be made. They speak with joy at the smiles. And you, when they talk about the children or the adults, who haven't had anybody to stand by them. And they, through the collaborative efforts of the Orthodox in this country, through uh, these institutionalized 
uh, endeavors, they've been able to, to receive help that they never fathomed would happen. And it's more interesting because it's from somebody that doesn't even know anything about them in a way. It's coming from America to, it's going to Africa. It's going in, in, to some areas in the uh, uh, former Soviet uh, group. That's the amazing thing. People are being helped, not because we know you, not because you're, you are better or worse, because God has called you. And I think that's the story that makes the greatest impact to me. I think it's wonderful that you say the first thing that they tell you about is Thanksgiving, because it is a difficult assignment that they have. These are third world countries to the nth degree, are they not? It, it, the conditions it is in many very times. Often it's, it's, not, it's not something that anyone can just go in and do. You have to have a special heart for this. And the heart has to say first and, and, and foremost, I am doing this to honor God. And in so doing, I take away everything else. Uh, and, you know, we're going to get some special instruction, what you have to do in the crowd, how you get from here to there, what you can, you know, how, how you're going to, to function as a, as a representative of the church. But they do it because it's taking off themselves and putting on Christ and going and serving. So that in all of these faces of the unknown, for these people, for these missionaries, they're serving Christ. They come in a way is Christ, and they go to find Christ. Beautiful way to look at it. Father John, you wanted to weigh in? Uh, yeah, I just, his, uh, his eminence spoke about, um, you know, the reach that we have in various countries, and I know his eminence, Archbishop Demetrius, mentioned on his official trip to uh, Russia that they took him to a, a hospital. I believe that it was a mental hospital and the largest one in that area. And they gave him a tour, and in the kitchen, they showed him the kitchen and the storage area, and there, there were boxes upon boxes stamped IOCC. So it was our IOCC here supporting those needs um, all the way across the world um, into a hospital. The boxes were supplies and food stuffs. Correct, and correct. That had to feel great for him to see that. He was, he was really <laughs> proud of it, very proud. So let me ask you, how can an individual or a parish, your eminence, be involved with these organizations because they are international groups? Well, what we usually have is uh, drives in the parish. We have speakers sometimes that come from the organizations, and very often we have representatives in the parish that represent that organization within the context of the parish and the life of the metropolis. If there's a question, there are websites. They can go through the Archdiocesan website to, to uh, get more information. Um, it's not hard. In today's world, it's very easy to make the inquiry. The hardest part, and really the most blessed part, is to, is to do the giving. And it's not hard. It can be $5, it can be $10, it can be signing up for a mission trip, it can be supporting a dinner that has a, a, a separate function. It's not hard, it's, just, it, it's easy, and I think we can all do something. And we've all grown up, I grew up here in America, hearing about other um, denominations who have mission trips every summer. And I don't think that the word is really out about our mission trips. Do you think we need to do a better job communicating this to our parishioners? You're a priest, you've got a flock. What, what is your take on that, Father John? Yeah, I think we absolutely have to do a better job of communicating it. It comes down, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, it comes down to fostering a spirit of giving, of sharing, that will then take someone across the country to, uh, to maybe a third world country <clears throat> and uh, offer this type of service. So I don't know if people can just pick up and do that. It takes a lot of groundwork, a lot of um, molding and um, local type of serving. So we definitely have to make that as a goal, but we have to fortify ourselves from, from the parish level and try to get to that point where people are equipped spiritually, emotionally, uh, physically, mentally, and ready to go out <clears throat> to serve in this unique way. In your eminence, there's a lot of outreach I know that takes place in each parish. What are some of the more dynamic ones? What are some of the more, well, out of the box things <clears throat> that the Orthodox Church is doing? It all seems normal. I can't, I, I, I don't know if there's something that seems, if I go, you know, parish by parish, I'll find that some of the parishes uh, do special work, for example, in hospitals. We have a local parish in Detroit. At, the, at, at Christmas time, they provide something for all of the children in the pediatrics unit. Somebody else has something for all of the oncology patients. I don't know that there's something that's so unusual. I think everybody tries something different. That's been my experience. I don't know, Father John, maybe you have a... Yeah, the, 
there, there seems to be the norms where, where we offer, but I, I think that we need to look at those untapped areas as well. And, um, and who determines what charities the parish is going to be involved in? Is it the people within? Right. Is there a decree from the metropolis? I, I think it's a, it's a, a collaborative effort. First of all, they have to be uh, charities that are at least uphold the work and function of the church as well as in, in terms of its desire to offer mercy and, and love and God's hope and grace. I think likewise we look at uh, uh, groups that work with the local community, that work with the metropolis, that work with the archdiocese. So I don't know that there's, um, there is a, a general list I think of, par of parish organizations and metropolis and archdiocese and international organizations that all of the parishes deal with. I don't, I just think it's a collaborative decision. Somebody says, I want, I want to give something to the medical luncheon. Great. That's, that's wonderful. Give to the medical luncheon. Help the lopto. Somebody else says, I want to, I want to give something to the Detroit mission. Great. Give to Detroit mission. Your Eminence, you were telling me about a program to help people financially, and you found that that had great success. <laughs> Well, we've been, uh, we've been finding that one of the problems in today's society is that our people are not clear on how money works. And since money is one of those tradable commodities that helps the poor that we can give, we have uh, worked on uh, helping our people understand that um, we have to kind of cut back on some of the things that are just about us so that we can do the work of God. Many of us, I'm, I'm going to take it that you and I and, and Father, we never grew up really understanding how, how money always worked. So our goal has been in some of these cases, in order to help people really achieve their, their missionary spirit, is to help them recognize uh, what you need to spend and what you don't need to spend. And that, that's been something we were doing in the metropolis of Detroit. Your Eminence, did you hear your parents always saying, now <laughs> did money doesn't grow on trees I like did, the rest of us? Money didn't grow on trees, <laughs> and my, our parents always said you had to pay cash. You had to pay cash, If that's you didn't right. have it, you didn't buy it. It was very simple. <laughs> and we're trying to, we, we, have, we have lived in a society now, and that's part of the problem of helping. Where everything is developed, centered around ourselves, we go out and charge to have a, a, you know, a closet full of things that we don't use, and those things can be given. The money could have helped. Somebody could have been brought closer to God's love and mercy. Yeah. Filling a void is, yes. is what I believe a lot of people try to do. Father John, let me ask you, should we be going beyond the issue of alleviating poverty and injustice? Should we take up those issues, I should say? I think the Roman Catholic Church has become pretty identified with dealing with issues of injustice. Mm -hmm. Should we be moving on beyond charity and taking up social justice issues as a faith? Right. Yeah, that's always a debatable issue, you know, how far out should we reach? And um, I, think, I think we have a voice. I think we have something important to say. In fact, I think we have the most important message. So we can't stand back, we can't be silent, we can't be isolated. I think we have to be present and we have to offer uh, the world, our Orthodox faith, and our moral convictions so that they can see what a body and community of believers that are faithful to God, they see what we do, what we think, what we say. It's a voice that cannot be silent. And we have to take initiatives, those people of our parishes that feel called to the po political world, the media, um, entertainment, education, whatever it is, they become our ambassadors. They are the ones that are taught and nourished within our parishes and are to go out and to try to make a difference. And we as parish, we as metropolis, we as archdiocese should offer support, direction, um, and whatever else we can to, to be that voice. We're, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. But we still have to be that, uh, that beacon of light and that beacon of hope. Your Eminence, going back to the uh, parish level of philanthrop uh, philanthropy, a lot of uh, people outside of our faith come to know Greek Orthodoxy through, for better or worse, the Greek festivals. <laughs> They're a wonderful vehicle of promotion. Uh, please, go ahead. I, I think the festival is absolutely marvelous in terms of uh, the community being able to open its doors and welcome the neighborhood. That's a great thing because otherwise, I mean, the basic foundation for 
that idea of community and family is to sit around the table together. We see it on a high level in the church when we receive from the same altar table. We sit around God's table and we are fed the body and blood of our Lord. We see it in the festival and in our homes. It's the same thing. My concern uh, for the festival is only that it sometimes is used for operational expenses. And I get a little bit concerned with that. I'm concerned because I think we are responsible to keep our churches running with our gifts and not always be dependent on somebody else. So you don't think we're doing a good enough job of sharing our faith with the community through these festivals? Um, I see increasing numbers of, tour, of people going on tours in our churches. And I would tell you that in the metropolis of Detroit, the history indicates to me after every festival, some people come back several times as families to see what the worship is like in our Orthodox Church. If we have, we'll have somewhere between three and five families in most parishes that I'm familiar with. We'll come back afterwards to see what's happening. So it opens the door. Um, I just look at it, it's prime to me, it's prime outreach is really opening for the community. Come and say hello. Come and you know, see who we are. People are, all, are not always clear. They think everybody who's at the Greek Orthodox Church must be Greek. They're not certain right. if Orthodox is Orthodox Jewish, it's Orthodox Christian, it's right. Orthodox, they're not always certain. So by, by having that ability to come in and say, Yasu, you know, Carlos Hiltate, by having that ability to see the, the, the culture with the dancers that usually show up, to try the foods, it's usually our own people working and, and, and helping. So I, I think it's good. I think it opens the door, and I think that in the metropolis of Detroit, and I'm going to assume everywhere, wherever there's a festival, mm -hmm. some people are coming in after to visit because they come in and they see the, they see the icons. They may be people who for the first time have seen an icon, and they, you know, they start the questions. Are you worshiping idols? What are you doing? So right. it becomes an interesting vehicle. Yeah. For sure. And who doesn't love a good souvlaki, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we thank you so much, Your Eminence. <laughs> and Father John Blachos, thank you so much. Thank and you. to watch more enlightening programs in this series, please log on to our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Greek Orthodox Church. I'm Stacey Spanos. Thank you for watching. Greeks, great dreamers, great travelers, great hosts. The Greek passion for traveling, for both knowledge and adventure, began long ago with Odysseus, the paradigm of the eternal traveler, with Herodotus, the first tourist and most famous storyteller, and with Pausanias, who wrote the first travel guide 2,000 years ago. Tourism, an idea created by the Greeks. Tourism in Greece is a heritage of pilgrimage. For the mind, Athens, the philosophers. For the body, Olympia, the games. For the spirit, Delphi, the oracle. Delos, the mysteries. Epidaurus, the drama. For life, as the poet Constantine Cavafy said, as you set out for Ithaca, hope that your road is long, full of adventure and discovery. In 1914, a visionary Greek statesman, Eleftherios Venizelos, founded the first national service for the organization of Greek tourism. From that point forward, the number of visitors, travelers, and pilgrims to Greece's ancient monuments and therapeutic hot springs began to increase. Greece's fame as a tourist destination now spread around the world. 
the 10,000 tourists of 1914 became 17 and a half million in 2014. Tourism indeed left an indelible impression on the early history of modern Greece. But the miraculous place and the timeless values remain the same. The light, legendary, dazzling, luminous, soft, tangible, infinite, spiritual. The land and light transform us as we journey. The land, each place so unique, so different, so special, and so close. Places that express a mysterious divinity. The mountain, heavy with snow. The sun, sparkling on the distant sea. Undulating sea of olive trees. Sugar cube villages tumble down mountains to the sea. Beaches of breathless beauty. The Aegean Islands, archipelago of dreams, stepping stones of summer. Temples, castles and churches, not dead shrines to the past, but reminders of how Greeks have responded and still respond to this unique and miraculous land. And the values too, the land's most precious inheritance, beauty, measure, proportion, and human scale show a balance between man and nature and make visible the dimensions of the heart. Hospitality, Greece's oldest art form. Long ago, Zeus showed his love of strangers by walking among men disguised as a common traveler. Since then, hospitality has been an important part of who Greeks are. Music, dance, food and friendship, never far away, these things are always shared. Festivals and feasts and random outbursts of celebration. Human, intimate, comfortable and friendly. And the concept of luxury is redefined. An aristocratic grace, ease and simplicity. Art and ideas and philosophy and songs and love fit the tempo of Greek life and arise spontaneously from this special land. The traveler to Greece discovers these qualities at every turn in a rare combination of heart and mind, simplicity, warmth and authenticity. Greece, a piece of heaven on earth.